All right, so we're back with Zach and Karen B. And we're still on the topic of the moon. I thought that was it, but no, they go on for quite, quite a bit about the moon. So that's what this video is going to be about. The moon. How do we know that it's real? Right, yeah, because there are people that aren't sure if the moon is actually a moon. You'll see. Let's move to his next proof. What's, what's odd is there are people who think Earth is flat. Right. But recognize that the moon is round. Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and the sun are all spheres. But Earth is flat. That's not, something doesn't square. Something doesn't there. jive, right? Now, I think that this is one of the weakest arguments that you could give against the flat Earth. It's hardly even an argument. It's more of a, a question of the thought process. So I'm not really going to cover much of their response to this because it's not particularly important, but they do say this. Almost all flat Earthers believe that stars and planets are just little lights in the sky. Not as big and far as NASA says. And if you still have the same question in your head, then here is something curious for you to think about. How do we know that the moon is a sphere? Have we ever seen the other side of it? Yes, actually, multiple spacecrafts have captured it, including the Soviet Luna 3, who did it first, NASA's Apollo 16 and a Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, as well as Discover. No. Or maybe not, let's just dismiss all of that, because who cares, who cares, right? When something is round and too far away from you, you cannot say what shape it is. It can be a flat plate, it can be oblate, it can be concave, it can be a sphere. You just can't tell. So looking at something round does not mean it's a sphere. Have you ever seen the moon rotating in the sky? You have always seen one side of it which makes it impossible for anyone to say the moon is spherical. So how do we know the shape of the moon? There's the fact that we have multiple images of the far side of the moon. There's the shape of the lunar phases, the way the moon reflects light in these phases, the fact that we can see it wobble and show slightly more and slightly less of it at times, all in a way that's perfectly consistent with a sphere and it's not really anything else. But no, there's no way we'd be able to tell. Just looks like a circle to me, that's all I know. Could be a disc, could be a random light up there somehow because that makes sense. Look, it's, it's much easier to just throw your hands up and say, hey, I don't know. I don't really know what it is. It gets in the way of my huge conspiracy theory that involves uh, every government and pretty much every scientist Right? I don't know. I don't have an explanation. I mean, established fact, who needs it? Observable proof, humbug. Because you're making yourself look fucking stupid. We will have to go to it. So who went to the moon? NASA or other space agencies? Who told you the moon is a sphere? NASA. NASA and other space agencies have been caught lying many times. How can we trust liars? If you think that they really went to the moon, then you need to do some good research before watching this video. No, they haven't been caught lying. Ridiculous conspiracy theorists like yourselves have accused them many times of many things, but all of these accusations are ridiculous. Pretty much every flat earth claim has a far better explanation. But let's look at the video that you showed. Now, that little animation when the thing pops in is in the original ESA video. It's not one of Zach and or Karen B's terrible edits for once. Now, that tells me that this was intentional and very much purposefully obvious. Before the transition, you can see the terrible cutout hiding the plushie. So it was always there, but they rather poorly edited it out to have a cool transition. And why would they do this? Well, you can see in the title of the video that this is a classroom demonstration, meaning that this was meant to appeal to kids. And having tiny little cool transitions like that works kind of somewhat, I think, maybe. Is this the kind of evidence that you have to disprove everyone that works in every space agency around the world, all astronomers and physicists, and millennia of research that tells us that the Earth is a globe. But as for the you have to do research before watching this video, isn't that 
kind of why I'm watching this video in the first place, to do research, to hear the claims that Flat Earthers make. This is a gish gallop, a little a little bit of a cleverly disguised gish gallop. But in order for me to respond to your claim of space agencies being caught lying, I now have to go through many, many more videos and respond to many, many more claims. I'm not going to do that, at least not here and not now. But I will say that every single flat earth claim is total bunk. And if you disagree with me, then you need to do more research. Go and watch all of my videos about the Flat Earth, past, present, and future, as well as every other video and internet article that responds to Flat Earthers. You cannot argue with me until you do, uh, but start with my videos. My videos are the best. All moon landings are staged and only a gullible person believes them. The moon landings have been proven time and time again, and the claims of conspiracy theorists have been thoroughly debunked time and time again. Only an idiot would think that the moon landings were faked or that the earth is flat. How did they even know that the moon is something they could walk on to send people to it? Well, from the ground, we can see that it has shadows, mountains, and craters, and we can observe its gravitational pull. And we've sent several lunar probes, including uh, impactors and landers, to collect information about it before we went there. This isn't hard, Zach. How can they go to the moon if at that time, the distance to it was unconfirmed? We've measured the lunar distance since the ancient Greeks, and in 1959, we used radar to calculate the distance with a precision of about 1.2 kilometers, or 0 .000003%. And in 1962, it was more accurately measured with lasers. How can they succeed at everything in their first try? They didn't. Three astronauts died during a test in Apollo 1. Besides that, Apollos 7, 8, 9, and 10 were all essentially tests to see that the landings would be successful. It's not like they were just going to send them up there without making sure everything worked. The later Apollo 13 was a failure as well. Why didn't they go back? They did, in Apollos 12, 14, 15, 16, and 17. Did you guys just forget about those? <clears throat> uh, alright. They lost the technology and it's a painful process to build it again. It's not me who's saying this. Check this out. I'd go to the moon in a nanosecond. Uh, the problem is we don't have the technology to do that anymore. We used to, but we uh, destroyed that technology and uh, it's a painful process to build it back again. <laughs> NASA? Are you, Are you telling, telling us that, that to get, get that, that incredible budget, budget to hire a bunch of lazy people? Painful, painful process? process? Seriously? It took me forever to find out where this clip was from because it's obviously cherry-picked and stripped of all context, but I found it on the International Business Times UK, so you have a citation now. You're welcome. Uh, but in it, he says that going to the moon should be our next step in space exploration for a number of technical uh, reasons and exploration reasons, and then after that, Mars. But here, here's what happened. We went to the moon in Apollo 11, 12, 14, 15, 16, and 17, and during that time, NASA's budget was at the highest it's ever been, at around 4% of the U.S. federal budget. But that didn't last. Apollos 18, 19, and 20 were cancelled due to budget cuts. You see, designing rockets and spacecrafts to go to the moon and back is very difficult to do, takes a lot of R&D, and is all around very expensive. In order to complete the Apollo missions, NASA needed that budget, and well, they lost it after the space race. There was nothing they could do, so they dismantled the equipment because they didn't foresee a use for them. Except for Saturn 
is it Saturn V or Saturn V, where they used it to launch the Skylab space station. At any rate, from what I understand, we essentially got all the information we needed from the Apollo missions that we did complete. I think uh, Apollo 15 was especially successful, apparently. Um, and yeah, and since then, NASA has been focused on other things like the space stations, stuff like that. In the article underneath this video, Don Pettit, Petit, I am terrified of pronouncing words that I don't know because I always get it wrong, but uh, Don says that exploring space is expensive. Right now, it's too expensive for any single country or company to do, so you have to work together to make it happen. The article goes on to explain that the ESA, or European Space Agency, aims to do that, being an international organization. I mean, think about it. If you personally were going to the moon today, would you want to use a spacecraft from the 1970s? Probably not. You'd probably want to use a newer spacecraft with more contemporary technology and is more likely to work. Thing is, building spacecrafts isn't easy. It's literal rocket science. It takes years of R&D. It takes several test flights, billions of dollars, and potentially some dead people. I know that your mind doesn't go very far beyond the simplest of explanations of space exploration because you can't seem to figure out that the moon is solid, uh, but it's not easy to just rebuild the moon landers. 